Okay, Honorable Dr. Leah Tedesta, Health Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Dr. Sushe, Sugu, and Betty Zazu, Academic and Research Vice Provost of St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College, Professor Wang Jian'an, President of the Second Affiliated Hospital Zhejiang University School of Medicine, Honorable Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm Ma Yao, an algorithm engineer from Alibaba Health. I'll be the host of the webinar today. Thank you so much for coming. So together with the Jack Ma Foundation and Alibaba Foundation, as part of our global Medi exchange for combating COVID-19 program known as GMCC, Alibaba Health is greatly honored to organize this webinar today. And the webinar, webinar between St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College and the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine. The GMCC program aims to facilitate online communication, collaboration across borders, and provide necessary communication channels to share practical experience about fighting COVID-19 for frontline medical teams around the world. To the end, Alibaba Health has invited multidisciplinary team to share their experience in managing COVID-19. The team is from one of our best hospitals in China, which is the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine. So, let's introduce the team. First of all, first of all Professor Wang Jian'an, he is the president of second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine and he's also the chair of the hospital's COVID-19 response, response steering committee. Welcome, Professor. Okay, thank you. Okay, <coughs> so next we have Professor Huang Jian. He's the vice president of second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine. Uh, he's also the oncology and chair of the hospital's COVID-19 response working committee. Welcome, Professor Huang. Hello. Next, we have Mrs. Lu Qun. She is the director of infection management department of the hospital. She's also an expert commissioned by National Health Commission to Wuhan. Welcome, Mr. Ms. Lu. Ms. Lu, hello. She's on the screen. Hi. She's on the side of. Okay. okay. She is uh, still be quarantined uh, for hotel. Just came back from Wuhan. All right. Okay. okay. Hi. So next we have Dr. Xu Feng. He's the director of infectious disease department of the hospital. He's also the director of the expert panel of hospitals COVID-19 response committee. Welcome, Dr. Xu. Last but not least, uh, we have two doctors. One is Xu Donghang. Dr. Hong, Xu Donghang is the web director of pharmacy department of the hospital. He's one of the members of the hospital's expert, expert team on COVID-19. Thank you for coming, Dr. Xu. Yeah. We also have Dr. Lu Xiao. He's an attending physician of emergency ICU, who is also group leader of the hospital medical team sent to Wuhan. Thank you so much for coming. Hello. Uh, the, in the open side, we have Dr. Lia Tedesta. She's the health minister of Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lia. And we also have Dr. Sushi, who, uh, so meanwhile, we have Dr. Sushi colleagues from the St. Paul's Hospital. St. Paul Hospital also invited medical directors and COVID-19 response coordinators from 22 other hospitals. These hospitals were designated by the Minister of Health as COVID-19 treatment centers. Thank you all for uh, participating in today's exchange on health preparations hospital needs to do to contain and manage, and manage the COVID-19. We hope today's session will set a great and a good foundation for the further exchange between medics from both countries so may we can fight the, the COVID-19 together. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. Lia, the Health Minister of Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, to say a few opening remarks. Dr. Lia, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's really great to be here, and thank you, Professor Wang, President of the Second Affiliated Hospital, Shenzhen University School of Medicine, and thank you, Alibaba Health and Jack Ma Foundation, for arranging this discussion today. 
I also would like to thank uh, my colleagues at St. Paul Hospital Millennium Medical College, the Provost Dr. Olga Magin, who I have seen has joined, and also Dr. Sisai, Vice Provost of Academic and Research, for all the leadership of all of you in arranging uh, also uh, many hospitals uh, also who are, have joined online today. The cooperation really has been guided by a strong leadership and strong partnership between our uh, Prime Minister, His Excellency Prime Minister Abi and uh, Mr. Jack Ma. And among the many supports that has been done the past uh, few weeks, today's discussion represents one of these many areas where our two countries are in close collaboration. And we are very hopeful that together we can better fight this outbreak globally and uh, save many lives. And uh, uh, just to say brief words on the status of uh, COVID outbreak in Ethiopia, uh, since the first case was uh, confirmed in Ethiopia on March 13, <clears throat> we have now reached to uh, 65 cases today. And uh, we've had... Uh, some recovery, around four of them who have recovered and two have passed away. And uh, the government has been really uh, trying to lead this preparedness and response with the leadership starting from our uh, Prime Minister, His Excellency PM Abi, and um, <clears throat> all the cabinet who are involved in the response. And uh, the Minister of Health, of course, uh, is leading the overall outbreak response in the, as a national command response team with a public health institute and all of the uh, institutions, health facilities in all the regions are part of this overall response in terms of ensuring we're doing uh, more testing and uh, isolation treatment in designated facilities and uh, ensuring that we have the necessary workforce and training for our <coughs> uh, for the needed for the response. Of course, there are many challenges, I'm sure that will be discussed uh, later, but especially the access to infection prevention, control, access to PPE, and also ensuring that we have strong uh, ICU care in many of our facilities is uh, one of our uh, big challenges that we are trying to address. And also expansion of testing is uh, one of the areas that uh, is a key priority area that we are focusing on while the government is also taking a lot of measures in terms of ensuring uh, prevention uh, as a key role in the society, especially the use of uh, social distancing and other measures to ensure social distancing have been taking place. So uh, we are really impressed by how China has really performed in this, in this outbreak response uh, with the uh, how with, with many challenges and that the large population that you have, you are able to co really contain in a short time uh, with a ag very aggressive approach. And uh, it, it has been an exemplary for many uh, of around the globe. So with this collaboration, we really look forward to hear a lot of practical lessons from how you are able to uh, mitigate and uh, suppress this outbreak to the status that you have now where uh, the current really status is really amazing. So we look forward to uh, get through the exchange also today that we get a lot of information from uh, you and also we will provide our experiences so far, our team and our, our uh, 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 health workforce who are engaged in this response will also provide uh, some information of what we are facing. Uh, and I believe it was also Jack Ma who said China has hard earned lessons that it can share with the world and with Ethiopia. So we are really looking forward to that. And more than ever, I think this is a time where the globe uh, needs more cooperation, global leadership, global solidarity is needed to solve this global challenge and uh, a time to learn from each other uh, to defeat this uh, really grave pandemic that we are having. So. We're also looking forward to embrace new technologies in this fight. And uh, we, we appreciate on behalf of the Minister of Health and the government of Ethiopia, I'm very glad that the JAGMA Foundation has offered this a new platform for the world to connect. So finally, I, I hope that this session marks the beginning and not the end of our discussions. 
and uh, um, I, would, I will be able to stay for part of this session and I would uh, I'd like to apologize ahead of time. Uh, but uh, this is a really an exciting opportunity and I recommend this conversation to continue, this exchange to continue on this global media exchange platform that has been established. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Leah. I feel um, this is a great conversation with you and so we can fight the COVID-19 together and to get a better result and contain the COVID-19 together. Thank you so much. So um, next we, I'd like to invite Professor Wang Jin'an to say a few opening remarks. Professor Wang Jin'an is the president of the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine. So, uh, Professor, please. Okay. Uh, dear uh, Dr. Lia, Dr. Sashi, uh, all dear friends from Ethiopia, it's my great honor to have the opportunity to share with you some of our experience in the prevention and the control of COVID-19. So our hospital has a long-term friendship with the Africa. Since 1970s, we have sent over more than 70 medical staff to five African countries for medical assistance. Now, two of our doctors are still working in Mali in fact, it's not the first time <clears throat> we fight against the infectious disease together with an African friend. <clears throat> Two experts of our hospital have been to Africa for fighting Ebola uh, several years ago. So one of them is uh, Dr. Xu, next to me. Oh, and then also uh, Dr. Lu. Uh, Dr. Lu is uh, both of them into uh, different countries like Mali and uh, what, 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 where's the other country? Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone to fight the Ebola. Seeing the outbreak of COVID 19 in China, on top of receiving and screening huge numbers of patients, we sent 180 medical professionals to Wuhan. They took full responsibility to operate a makeshift intensive care units where <clears throat> ordinary work need to be quickly converted into ICU to treat the most critical and severe patients. Up to this date, we haven't had any medical staff who got infected while treating our patients. Nor had they missed out on our suspected cases. As our president, she always say, we human beings live in a community of a shared future. The whole world is fighting the same battle against one common enemy, the virus. Finally, I hope with our joint efforts, we can win the fight against COVID-19 soon. We cherish the profound friendship between our hospital and Africa. That was forged more than 15 years ago and look forward for more collaboration with you in the future. Thank you so much, all of us. Thank you so much. Um, for today's session, we'll first have a presentation by Professor Wang Jian on hospital strategies to prevent and control COVID-19, and it will follow by QA session. To ensure the sound quality of the presentation, I'd like to ask all participants to hold your question at the end of the presentation, and uh, please put your phones on mute for now. Thank you so much. Okay, so without further ado, please let me invite Professor Wang to give his Presentation. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, it's my honor to have the opportunity to share my slides. The title of my slides is uh, <clears throat> Hospital Strategies to Prevent and Control COVID 19. Um, the first thing during the time of the outbreak, 
for hospital management, it's very important to set up task forces in response to the outbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> hospital set up the eight functional forces, eight functional functional teams during the outbreak, including the like the epidemiology investigation and the quarantine team, like the hospital infection control, like the information center, like the donation team, etc. But uh, <clears throat> however, there are two main purposes. So for during the right time, the, for the hospital management, most important uh, first one is protection of your staff. Mm -hmm. Then property management of your patients. So how to protect your staff? <clears throat> First one, I still want to emphasize the use of the masks, facial masks. So the reason there are three reasons. The first one is uh, we know there are many patients and they, they are in incubation period. So during that time, the patient may not have symptoms. So now we are now there are more and more patients, maybe around 5% uh, of patients. They are asymptomatic patients, so they don't have symptoms. So nobody know they are infected or not. Uh, also, we get some information. We know the aerosol or droplets in the eye may cause the infection. So uh, if the, face, the facial masks are not available, uh, some kind of the closed face cover is recommended, especially when uh, when you have uh, the, the mask gallery or you are face to face somebody else. So you don't know what is the situation about the, the people just facing you. It's a better way to use the facial mask or facial cover. Uh, <clears throat> another important uh, element is to, during the outbreak of time, is to centralize the staff management. And in our hospital, uh, we, build, we build our staff pipeline. So we try to, uh, most of those uh, medical staff from the internal medicine uh, related specialists, but even some from the surgical department. So we need to build a staff pipeline. We need to train those doctors well, let them know the not let them to understand the, the COVID-19 and how to treat these kind of patients, how to prevent the infection, etc. So all of those medical staff, they are working in uh, uh, for the fever clinic, they are working for isolation ward, they are working for sampling. So they are working. Uh, they are working for the testing. So usually, because we we don't want our staff to be too fatigued. You know, if staff is too fatigued, may easy be may easy to catch the infection. So usually, our hospital policy is uh, four hours for each shift. You know, our staff they are working the fever clinic to wear the protecting material. Uh, it's uh, not so easy for them. It's not so be intolerable when they wear them so long time. So our policy is uh, four hours for each shift. Um, all of those stuff will be controlled and managed by the infectious disease department. Uh, <clears throat> the one of our policy is for all of those staff that are working in uh, this this place, this they are working in this uh, highly dangerous place. Uh, your hospital provide accommodation uh, for their staying. So your when they finish work, they, they don't go home. Uh, they just stay in the uh, we rent the hospital rent the rooms for them to stay in. So. When they finish the all of jobs, before they are uh, 
go back to home or go back to the original job, we need to quarantine them for 14 days for, for two weeks uh, in a hotel. So try, try our best to prevent crossover infection. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> during the time of outbreak, you need to take care of all of your staffs, uh, especially where about their health. healthy. Uh, any staff may make, make, make out some kind of symptoms. So <coughs> it's a very important. We let every staff working in our hospital need to report their healthy status. And also there are travel, traveling history every day. So until now, we still keep the regulation. So every morning, everybody, need to input your information on your mobile. So for some of the staff, they, are, they never use the mobile, they may can feel some kind of phones. But for 98% of the, our staff, they have mobile phones, so they can just report their healthy status through their phone. Uh, we pay a lot of attention about the uh, staff's uh, travel history. We want everybody to report they are, they, where they have been outside, especially outside the province or as outside our city. Uh, have you been in Wuhan? Do you know? Used to be Wuhan is a, a dangerous place. Uh, all nowadays, we, we let them to report to us where they have been overseas. So, so this kind of the epidemiology investigation looks very important, even to your medical staff. Uh, <clears throat> the, the other, the, uh, another important strategy is to how to use the PPE. Especially initial, the time of the outbreak, always shut out PPE. So for the hospital management, you have to make a lot of effort to properly use the PPE. So anyway, we let the hospital infection control committee uh, to uh, assess the circumstances and uh, develop a tailored policy of personnel protective management for the whole hospital, based on five elements. First one is the risk of, risk of exposure, then the severity of the epidemic, then the characteristic of patients you treat, you, fa you are facing. The fourth one is the availability, availab uh, availability of the resources. You, are, you have a plenty of resources or, you, you are, or not. Then the national guidelines. So you know, we send almost 200 staff members to Wuhan. So all of the members sent by our hospital, we need to supply their PPE. So they are our priority, absolutely. First, we need to keep the enough resources of PPE for them. Uh, <clears throat> in our practicing, uh, we classified the, our staff posts into three levels. So level one means uh, not so exposable. Level two means uh, moderate exposable. Level three means a highly dangerous post, a highly dangerous job. So they need the highest level of the PPE. The second thing is uh, how to properly management of our patients, okay? Uh, <clears throat> hospital is uh, the main of our strategy is a base space management, or we call it the space controlling. We need to separate way in and uh, way out. So check the temperature, temperature, body temperature for everybody 
they want to get in the hospital. Uh, in hospital, we uh, set up dedicated CD examination room in an isolated space, in an isolated area, where it's very close to the fever clinic. So we expanded our fever clinic space. Uh, we try to open the, we, we try to convert the regular world into the isolation world, several regular world into the isolation world. Uh, we facilitated a lot to the fever clinic. Like the inside the fever clinic area, we set up the pharmacy, <clears throat> we set up the lab test, we set up the, uh, so we set up the DR, the regular X-ray. So all of those facilitation is very good for the running of the fever clinic. So for those patients uh, with the fever, they don't need to go the, everywhere in the hospital. So may cause the other body infection. Um, all of fever patients, with a body temperature minus 37.5, they need to go to the RP fever clinic. For those the emergency cases with the fever, we set two parts into in the emergency room. The one part is for the emergency case with the fever. The other part is the emergency case without the fever. So it's easy for, for us to screen those patients. Uh, this 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 one is uh, epidemiology survey form. So when we screen in patients whether they are highly suspicious or confirmed cases, we need to let all of them to answer those questions. So like the where have you been traveled? So have you been in Wuhan, Hubei, or overseas? Uh, do you take the public transportation or do you take the private transportation? coming from other cities. So as we know, if you take the public transportation, maybe you are a highly exposable person. So have you contact with the confirmed cases or highly suspicious cases? So uh, do you have fever or other uh, respiratory symptoms during the last 14 days? Um, <clears throat> during the time of the of the outbreak, uh, there are always it's not so easy to treat the regular patients. So for the most of the chronic disease patients, uh, we prescri we give them a long time the prescription, like the hypertensive patient, like the atherosclerosis patient. So those, for those kind of patients, they are quite stable. So we don't allow we, we pursue them not come to hospital so frequent. So the insurance, co the insurance company, they exchange their policy, they allow the medical staff to give the three months prescri prescription. So for the uh, other patient, they want to have a surgery um, for the, do not for the very stable patient. So we, we persuade them not to come to, hospital to do the regular surgery, maybe they just uh, wait for the disappear of the outbreak. For the emergency surgery, uh, including trauma, stroke, like the acute surgeries and uh, other acute surgeries, <clears throat> we just, our staff just try our best to do the surgery for the patients. But all of those medical staff, they, they have a highest level of the protection equipment. Because we don't know, the patient we treat, we, we, we do the surgery, it's a, it's a COVID-19 patient or not. Uh, for some patient, uh, they are, we call the semi-elective surgeries. Uh, for all of those semi-elective surgeries, patient, uh, for all of those patients coming for semi-elective surgeries, such as the tumor dissection, the vascular surgery, not so critical, but uh, they still want doctors to do the surgery as soon as possible. So for this kind of patients, we regularly do the screen, uh, do the screen test. We do the PCR test. Uh, for those patients that, when they need an incubation, we do both. We do the PCR. We also do the chest imaging to see if there are any sign of the 
uh, virus pneumonia. Um, during the hard time of the outbreak, uh, we actually uh, we suspend the, some kind of the clinical procedures and the examinations. Uh, like the dental care, actually we stopped the regular dental care, uh, except that it's a critical cases, an emergency case with the dental care. We, we suspend the ENT uh, clinic. Uh, we suspend the primary function tests. Uh, we even uh, suspended endoscopy. But just one month ago, we started endoscopy again. What we do is uh, suspected and uh, confirmed cases. So for this uh, suspected patients, uh, if they have a positive epidemiologic history and a clinical manifestation, usually we isolation we isolate those patients at a hospital uh, in one area. We do the test, PCR test. We are waiting for the test result to come out. So if the test the twice PCR test are normal, not positive, are negative, so it uh, goes through the routine medical care. If one time positive, we isolate 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 this patient in a very in single room or single space. We repeat a test, but the two tests need a separate for 24 hours. For those confirmed patients, we hospitalize them in an isolation ward. <clears throat> so some ward with a facilitate this facilitated with the negative pressure ward. Uh, if without negative pressure, doesn't matter. Just uh, very important keep the confirmed cases in the in a ward. So same time we report to the CTC. We do a lot of job to help CDC to trace close contacts with the confirmed cases. Uh, what, what is the standard for patient well, for confirmed patient be discharged? So what is the our standard uh, policy? Uh, including uh, four elements. The first one is uh, significant improvement in the respiratory symptoms. Second one is body temperature return to normal for at least three days. Everybody need to do before they are discharged, need to have a prominent imaging URA CT scan. So make sure uh, the region already gone, uh, especially the exudation will be disappear, will disappear. Absolutely most important is uh, they need a test, PCR test. Need to be at least twice are negative, but each test will be taken with a 24-hour interval. So after all of those patients who meet the discharge criteria, the regular policy in China, we still keep those patients, we still quarantine those patients for another 14, for other 14 days. Uh, all of patients need to be back to hospital the second, the second week and the first week after discharge. Uh, we just finished a uh, brochure. Uh, the name of the brochure is uh, COVID-19 Outbreak Hospital Response Strategy. So we are going to release tomorrow. Hopefully, the book will be uh, will be a give you a good hand to help you to fight against the COVID nineteen. So thank you for all of your attention. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So let's move on to the Q&A session. For the Q&A session, it's our pleasure to invite Professor Huang Jin to host our joint Q&A session. So for this session, we have already collected some questions from uh, Ethiopia, uh, from the doctors and hospitals already. Uh, we'll go through these questions first and then move on to the opening up questions for, uh, from Ethiopia. Um, and let me introduce Professor Wang Jin. He's the Vice President of Second Affiliated Hospital, Georgia University School of Medicine. He's also the Professor of Oncology and Chair of the Hospital COVID-19 Response Working Committee. So, uh, Professor Wang, please. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'd like to answer the questions you present. So there are friends from the Ethiopia colleagues, and uh, the first question is about the uh, in the case of the shortage of medical resources such as PPE and a test case, we how should a hospital prioritize the use of such resources? I think the question. First, I turn to the President Wang to answer, please. Okay, actually, I already answered uh, in my slides. Uh, very important, you need to give the priorities. Uh, the priorities should be given to the people working in the isolation world, a fever clinic, or the job of sampling and uh, do the, uh, doing the test and other, other procedures with high risk of exposure. Uh, you, you very, uh, very important, you need to let some dedicated people to manage and control the allocation of the PPE, avoid the waste. Uh, during the outbreak of time, uh, try to organize a special task Force, a special task force for donation. Don't forget, the power of society is huge. Social donation help our hospital a lot to go through the hardest time of our break. Finish? Okay. Yes, I finished the first question. Okay. So the second question is about how do you manage the patients who are waiting for the test results and uh, prevent infection among them? How much spaces do you allocate? I think the question will turn to the Dr. Xu, who is the head of the infectious disease department, chief physician. Dr. Xu, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, in our hospital, we can provide uh, provide an isolation ward for each patients who are waiting for the uh, test results. And in our hospital, one patient uh, stay at uh, one single room with uh, his uh, face mask. And uh, during isolation, the medical staff uh, on duty to take care of these patients and uh, during the peak period we can immediately provide more than 20 rooms for these patients thank you okay so the very important thing is uh, one suspected patients are uh, one guy in one room okay thank you so the third question is about uh, what training must be given to the medical staff in the different zones in the hospital. So I think I will, I'd like to answer the question. So we have the policy to train our, all our medical staffs, including the physicians, nurses, medical students, residents, etc., to have specific uh, training about uh, the COVID-19. So for the all staffs, we all know the latest uh, requirement of the COVID-19 prevention and control, personal protection knowledge and the skills, etc. For physicians, 
the latest diagnosis and treatment plan, diagnosis and treatment procedures, and the disease prevention guidelines of the Chinese uh, guidelines of COVID-19 all should be learned by each physicians and, uh, and the nurses. Medical technicians, they will know the operation procedure related to the COVID-19, like uh, PCR test or blood test, etc. Nurses, the rural nurses nursing COVID-19 patients, such as epidemiology survey, visit management, and the nursing care of uh, COVID-19 patients. For logistics staff, training of uh, personal protection against the COVID-19 disinfection procedures of the healthcare environment, including equipment, floors, etc. Also, the first line posts of COVID-19 prevention and uh, protection. This is a very special post. Should we more, pay more attention to the such kind of stuff? So target training should be conducted according to the post requirements. Just now, President, President Wang has mentioned that each area have a different PPE and uh, we have uh, divided into three levels of uh, PPE. So, especially for techni technical standard related diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19 operation procedures, personal protection levels and the protection procedures, etc. So all should be uh, posted and also should be noticed by notice that each uh, physician and the works so they all follow our hospital policy to prevent and control the COVID-19. That's my answer. So now we turn to the fourth, fourth question, please. Fourth. Turn down. Oh, okay. First, can medical staff who are working with COVID-19 patients in fever clinic work in other departments and with other patients in the hospital? This question turn to the President Wang, please. Um, okay, uh, just like, actually I already mentioned in my slide presentation, uh, for those medical staff, they are working in the fever clinic of isolation world, uh, those uh, very highly uh, dangerous place. And usually, we, uh, hospital ac uh, provide accommodation. Uh, they don't allow, they, they, are not, they will not be allowed to, uh, to stay with other uh, medical staff. They are not working in this area. So usually, they, are, they have a separate place for, for eating meals, uh, hospital run a rooms from hotel to quarantine them at night. They are they just uh, stay in the hotel. Uh, so if they finish their job, uh, they, they would like to go home or back to the, the original job, they, uh, they need to be quarantined for 14 days. Uh, also, we usually we, for everybody, we do the test, do the PCR test. If the PCR test are negative, uh, during the 14 days, they don't have any symptoms, should be okay, they can go back to the original job, their original job, or go, go to home to meet uh, his family members. Uh, for like the uh, Wuhan team, they, we send uh, our team to the Wuhan. They already be back actually uh, 10 days ago, but we, after they are uh, coming back, they, all of them be quarantined in a hotel for 14 days. So now they have for possibly five more days they will come back to hospital and uh, to meet their family. Okay, thank you. So the first question, I'd like to answer the fifth question. What is the doctor-patient nurses ratio? So the ratio, it depends on the, you know, the working area of the physician or, or nurses. So in the ICU department, the patient to pay, the doctor to patient ratio 
is usually a team of doctors will take care of one, uh, 10 to 12 pairs. One doctor will see 20 to 30 outpatients within four hours. Nurse to patient ratio. Inpatient, one to five, depend on workload. Outpatients, one to 20 to 25, depending on working load. So for the fever clinic, we usually with one doctor, 10 patients ratio within four hours. Each shift is same the uh, same ratio. So that's the answer. Thank you. So I, I'd like to answer the sixth question. Are there any particular types of patients to pay different attention to? It's it's such uh, example, pregnant woman, child, children and elderly people. Now the question to the Dr. Xu, please. Uh, okay. Uh, health, health patients uh, might have a typical or uh, some slight uh, clinical many uh, presentations. So, for, for example, they show the normal body temperature or some extrapulmonary symptoms. So, for the elder patients, they need a lot of uh, attention. And uh, uh, it's suggested that, that for health patients, uh, they uh, will be done, uh, will be done the, uh, for detection, uh, artificial for detection, uh, nuclear acid detect, if needed. And uh, for some pregnant, pregnant women or children, we suggest them should be firstly get uh, Get uh, uh, get uh, some some detections, uh, for example, nucleosid detection by RT PCR and uh, and uh, antibody against the coronavirus detection uh, is uh, firstly, and uh, sometimes for these patients, uh, radiology examinations, including chest X-ray or CT scan, should be deleted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xi. And uh, I'd like to also invite uh, uh, other parts of the uh, doctors from just uh, come back from Wuhan. Uh, can you answer some questions in uh, 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 six questions? Any additional answers to the questions? For all patients, for pregnant women, for children? Uh, so. Yeah. We, we do not have any experience uh, for the pregnant uh, women or children in Wuhan, but there are many uh, old patients in our ICU in Wuhan. And uh, the, the old patients have the, the high mortality uh, than the younger patient. We, we have this experience. And uh, if the patient is the old patient have the intubation, uh, most of them will be dead from the, the uh, dead from the COVID-19. So, uh, as we as we said before, we must pay attention to the, uh, the older patients. If the, if they have the symptoms uh, or the suspect suspect the COVID-19, we will include them the early term and treat in the early term. Thank you. So I would uh, like to add something for the elderly patients. Uh, in Wuhan, uh, uh, my team members, they, are treat, they, they treated one patient, a couple. Uh, the, the guy is uh, 98 years old. Actually, his wife is 87. So possibly uh, they are the oldest couple in China with COVID-19. So very important, the regular treatment may be not so intolerable, maybe not, not intolerable for, for the old patients. So like the, the, this couple, we stop the antivirus medication because antivirus medication causes so big side effects for these the elderly patients. So for these kind of patients, we need to do case by case. So we, we draw the antivirus medications, we stop some of the other medications, 
but the patient, the couple getting better. At last, they are both of them were discharged. Okay. Okay, we have finished all the six questions. I hope it will be helpful to your your side from uh, Ethiopia. So now it's open for the question from the Ethiopia side. Please, do you have any question? We'd like to answer. Actually, Professor Fong, they already sent some questions okay. through, yeah, through the website. Website? Um, or yeah, website? Yeah, okay. so uh, let me clarify them. So first, for the suspected cases, uh, what do you think the size of isolations? But we need to consider the size of the Ethiopia's hospitals. They usually have like less than 400 beds or 300 beds. So how do you think the size of isolations? Size of isolation. Do you know our hospital are 200 beds? So we we set up uh, set up the 300 beds. Yes. 300 beds for the uh, functions of isolation beds. Um, but depends, I think, for the 400 beds, maybe you need to take 10 percent, uh, 15 percent of your beds for isolation of of highly suspicious patients or isolation of the confirmed cases. For the four confirmed cases, for you can put the confirm several confirmed cases in a in a in a single room, in a room. But for the difficulty is to for the highly suspicious case because you are not being confirmed. So that you you need to put the for those patients you need to provide a single space for highly suspicious patients. Right. Yeah. So. So we also have a, you know, uh, 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 with the ward and the clinic together. So we have a fever clinic and an emergency clinic for specific uh, patients with fever and the suspected patients. So if the patient is suspected, we have a special room for the zampering. And, uh, and then after zampering, we'll go to the isolation ward. So that's a process of the whole whole management of the suspected cases. And also we leave some ICU ward for the emergency cases, with emergency suspected cases. So we have a uh, at least 10, we have two campus, at least 10 wards, ICU wards with a pressure, negative pressure to, to, to isolate the, the suspect, suspected cases. But it's better to let the patients Keep the distance. Uh, only, uh, in our regulations, at least one meter apart, the two patients. Uh, if it's okay for a patient, let the patient wear the facial mask. Was she, do you have any question? Uh, any answer? Okay. Yes. No, no, no. Okay. Okay, so for friends in Ethiopia, does this answer answer your questions? Can we move on to the next one? Okay, so we move on to the next one. Uh, so, uh, how do you manage recovered patients when they can be released? Already uh, since the edition of the national guideline, and actually I already presented on my slides, really, the four elements. The, the first one is uh, the symptoms need to be gone, then uh, fever, the body temperature need to be back to the normal uh, for at least three days. Uh, then the PCR test need to be uh, negative for at least twice test. Uh, each test need to be 24 hours separate. Then the uh, CT scan of the lung or the DR. If you don't have CT, you can do the DR. The, uh, the chest sedation need to be disappeared. Right? Okay, then uh, in Chinese policy, we still are discharged. We still quarantine those people in a central quarantine then for 14 days. Uh, yeah. Yes, mm. exactly. Okay, so let's move on. So for the recovered patients, and how do you prevent them from being reinfected? Uh, I'm not an expert actually, and uh, another uh, other expert to answer the question. Is it better? Uh, who, who is it? Dr. Xi. Oh, Dr. Xi. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, she is the chief of uh, infection disease department of our hospital. Two years ago, uh, he went to um, went to Sierra Leone to find the Ebola. Okay. 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 I try to answer your question. And uh, your question is of how how to prevent uh, patients from from being reinfected. And uh, for the, for the patient, for the recovery patient, uh, they uh, as talked uh, by Pre President Wang, they should uh, keep stay at a central quarantine hotel for at least uh, two weeks. After that, uh, they can go to the routine work and the original uh, original work uh, position and uh, for them very important things uh, is uh, one uh, still wear still wear face mask uh, two two and uh, two wash their hands wash their hands regularly regularly three uh, three the third thing uh, is uh, still uh, still keep uh, Social distance, uh, uh, at least one meter away between uh, two persons, and uh, for uh, according uh, we according list suggestions, the recovery the patients will be safe. And uh, and uh, another thing, another thing for the recovery patients, the antibodies, the protective antibodies for uh, IgG against the coronavirus should be come out in most of recovery patients. These antibodies will be very helpful against the uh, prevent them from the infection. Thanks. So uh, actually in Wuhan, they regularly check the patients uh, be discharged. So also 100% they have uh, immunity. So they can, uh, IgM are positive, IgG and uh, IgM are, are positive. But we we'll reach out. Yes. So if you have something for the question, please. Yes. Uh, uh, first, I think, uh, you 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 will uh, the patient uh, when the patient discharged uh, they will quarantine for two weeks and uh, uh, some patients will uh, almost um, most of the patients will uh, have the PCR test again before they release the quarantine and uh, to make sure the PCR test is uh, the negative and uh, of course uh, as the professor once said that uh, uh, before they discharge. From the hospital, we will uh, test their antibiotics and uh, uh, to make sure it's uh, if it is a positive and uh, uh, and uh, we will uh, we will make sure if the uh, the PCR because some some uh, some doctor to make the PCR test is uh, the uh, negative. But we must we must make sure if this is the real negative. Some test is uh, is there have been some results is uh, is the false negative. So we will try to test uh, more than twice or uh, three times for the patient. Thank you. So what is the meaning of the IgM in serum? If the patient has a positive IgM, so means they they have immunity. They have infected recently. The IgM is uh, infected recently. Oh, what is about the IgG? IgG. What is the meaning of IgG? If the, those kind of patients they have a IgG positive, means they have an immunity. Yeah. Yeah. They have an antibody. Yeah. They have an antibody. Any studies? Yeah, yeah, I mean, possibly they have the immune immune uh, power to the uh, COVID nineteen, but it's uh, it's about some some patient some of our patients is uh, the the antibiotics is uh, negative, so it's uh, I think it's easy easier easier to have the 
in fact again maybe so we, we will uh, we will just not uh, discharge this patient okay so next question next question is do you test every patient admitted to the hospital do you test any every every patient <laughs> And actually, during the whole time of outbreak, we we test also everybody admitted in the yeah, in inpatient department. But then later, uh, recently, we changed our policy because the situation in our country is becoming very, is much better than before. So now we only do uh, some patients when they need a surgery, as especially if they need the general anesthesiology for intubation for those uh, big surgery. For some of the procedure uh, related to the uh, pharyngeal or bronchial, uh, some kind of the procedure, for those kind of patients, they need a test. For regular patients, you know, now we don't do any test for them. So uh, PCR, uh, nuclear acid uh, test is very important. Especially during the outbreak, first outbreak of the COVID-19. But uh, if the patient is emergency uh, for for operation or something that we should uh, do operate two PCR tests also do operation at the same time and uh, but with the highest uh, uh, PPE for the physicians and also and for the our, our other staffs. So now the incidence, the, out, the outbreak now is controlled. So we have we have less le less people with the uh, uh, PCR test because we have a very you know in very confirmed um, epidemiologic uh, investigation. And also no symptoms and no fevers, and also we have a green coder. If the patient with a health condition, with the government will give them the a green green coder. It's based on the big data. So that all these kind of patients we will omit the PCR test. So that's. That's why we now have less people have the PCR test. And at the beginning, we, we have early, early patients will have give, give the PCR test. So that's the way our policy will gradually release and will, will omit the PCR test recently for so, some uh, kind of patients. Okay. So today we have a pharmacist join us. So do you have any questions for the pharmacy? pharmacy. For pharmacy. So pharmacy, Mr. Xu is here. Any more questions for him? So he never answered the question. Okay. <laughs> I can probably give them some time to prepare the questions. And okay. Uh, later okay, on. good, good. Okay. So uh, the next question is, how do you manage patients with asthma, quarterly uh, asthma? Asthma. Xiao Chuan. Uh, Maybe I thought I sent a letter to Dr. Lu to answer the question. Uh, so he because he he had an experience to treating patients. So uh, do you do you meet any patients with uh, COVID COVID nineteen symptoms with the asthma? So what kind of special treatment do you do you use? <laughs> We do not have any patients with asthma, but we have the patients with COPD. Uh, some old patients with COPD, and the, the uh, I think the lung uh, function is uh, decreased before they in, in fact infect the COVID-19. So after the infection, maybe it's uh, just uh, decreased severely. So maybe these patients will be intubation at the early time. And uh, after intubation, if, the, if this patient is the older patient, I think it's hard to win in the uh, ventilator. So they, they will be a uh, long term to have the ventilator treatment. Maybe, 
and uh, the uh, it, the um, progranus is not so good. Uh, uh, they are quite funny phenomena uh, for the for the COVID nineteen patients. They are looks like they are more tolerable to the hypoxemia than the other patients, right? When there are saturations lower than ninety, like the, around eighty five, they still can work in the world. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So, so why? So what, what is the the reason for that? Uh, we do not know because we have found the symptoms of most of our patients. Uh, they are so high tolerance of the hypoxemia they can drink and they... people. But uh, the CT scan shows the uh, severe ARDS maybe, and uh, so so it's hard to uh, diagnose of these patients if these patients need the the, uh, the intubation or they just uh, treated with the non-invasive ventilator or the high flow. I think that uh, if the patients uh, uh, have the infect with COVID-19 and mm -hmm. asthma, if this asthma is not the acute asthma, uh, I think it will be okay. Only maybe use some uh, steroid uh, just during the treatment will be okay for, for those patients. And, and uh, I, I think for for the least patients, uh, uh, for for the least patient, COVID patients uh, uh, with asthma, and uh, for this patient just uh, got mild asthma, we just uh, use the anti asthma drugs as routine, and uh, for the clinical patients. Uh, for the clinical ill patients, uh, I think uh, oxygen, oxygen therapy or BiPAP uh, is, used, is used as if needed. And uh, sometimes uh, these patients should be got a lot of attention and uh, keep uh, be, uh, being monitored uh, all the time. If we meet uh, emergency conditions, uh, these patients should be get uh, mechanical ventilation as soon as possible uh, in order to decrease their mortality rate. Thank you. Okay, next question. Okay, so do you use any chemiprophylaxis for medical staffs? What should you want? Chinese uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, 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 uh,在中国的医务人员,包括一些千倍一些病人中,或者一些非常好的效果。也有一个好的效果，但是呢，从啊，可能这些都需要一些一些大的研究，或者说多中心的来去呃来证明啊，它的预防性有效果啊，回到你。So I just uh, add uh, some some uh, answer. Uh, I translate some uh, uh, answers to the uh, the compound. So is there any no specific uh, drug? Drugs for for the prevention of the COVID nineteen at least now. So in China we have a special uh, drug like uh, Chinese herbs to prevent, but uh, still lack of uh, very uh, evidence. Uh, evidence now. Not not still just uh, you know personal experience for that. And I think uh, uh, use uh, Chinese herb. You may mainly focus on the immunity to so improve the immunity of the people, the population, and also and then anti the the virus. So for the 
for the antivirus drugs available now, it's not a suggestion to have uh, to use for the chemo prevention at now. So, so I think the most easiest and the use, useful ways is you know wear mask, social distance, and uh, hand hygiene. That will be easy to do and uh, very helpful at least now. So I think uh, uh, we should uh, change our lifestyle first. Thank you. We we'll like uh, add uh, a couple of comments. And in, mainland, in mainland China, uh, traditional uh, Chinese traditional herb, Chinese traditional medicine is popular. Maybe, maybe we can give it a try if applicable. Another thing is we still can give it a try to use uh, interferon alpha, inhaled, inhaled interferon alpha, or get demosin uh, alpha one injection. This drug was used to just uh, enhance body immunity against the potential infection, but not uh, have any ability directly to against uh, coronavirus. If possible, if possible, you can try. Okay, next question, please. Okay, so how to deal with the patients with psychiatric disease? And how do you deal with panic of non-COVID patients in the hospital? So this kind of uh, psychiatry uh, mental disorder patients, we should uh, separate to the other area because the, this patient is a specific patient to need a specific care. So we, at that time, we not allowed the family to accompany the patients. So we, our staff will take care of the patients. So each patient will be isolated in single room and uh, keep uh, them not uh, touch each other. Uh, actually, we send a uh, psychiatrist. We will send out the chief of psychiatry from our hospital to join the Wuhan team. So uh, actually, he had a lot of abilities. Uh, for those uh, severe mental illness patients, absolutely need to be there are in Wuhan, there are some hospitals uh, which just receive these kind of patients. For the moderate to minor psychiatric problem, you will just uh, take medications and pay more attention to those patients. Uh, very important, uh, try to <coughs> let the psychiatrist to join the, the rescue team. So not just for the patients, but also for the staff psychology problem. You know, we send uh, almost 200 the colleagues to there. They are they went to Wuhan and uh, and they meet so critical, so many critical patients, so many uh, our staff. They have a psychology problem. So uh, the psychiatrist we send join the team who join the team did a so great actually. He, he contribute a lot to uh, to contribute. So did a great contribution to the stabilize stabilization of the, our team. So psychiatrists at that time is so important. So our staff need a psychiatry support because of stress. So at least uh, some some you know some staff will meet the very serious. Patient, the uh, cases of patient uh, conditions of patients, so they need, uh, you know, sub psychiatry support for the for the our staffs. So that's uh, very necessary. Next question, please. So for suspected <coughs> cases requiring emergency surgeries, what special precautions do you take? Also, actually, uh, already answer uh, on my presentation. I, I would like to uh, repeat again. Uh, for those patients coming for the uh, uh, for, for those patients with a critical situation, they come to for surgery. Uh, we don't have time to screen them whether they are cases of whether they are COVID nineteen or not non COVID nineteen. Uh, we 
just treat them as quick as possible. However, every medical staff fit to treat the patient need to have a high level of PPE. Okay. Yes. yes. So due to the time constraints, uh, we have to leave one more question. So anybody uh, online want to ask a question? I understand Dr. Yakal Muchi from the Alert Medical Center has a question. Dr. Muchi? Your yeah, mic is open. Okay, thank you. Let me ask one question. Uh, what is the rationale in uh, use of steroids in um, COVID patients? Nationally. Sorry. Sorry. Um, Dr. Mochi. The rationale in use of steroids. Rational use of steroids, right? Steroids, steroids, steroids. Uh, so Dr. Rishi, would you like would you like to answer the question uh, about the steroid for patient? What's your principle? Okay. Uh, in our experience in Wuhan, in our uh, ICU, we just uh, use the steroids for the very severe patients. Uh, for the short term, about uh, uh, f three to five days, and uh, at the uh, very small doses, um, uh, we we think it can uh, stop or just uh, decrease decrease the, the aggressive aggressive of the long uh, the long aggressive of the CT scan. We just. Uh, um, because some patients have very severe ARDS, and uh, even if after even after they just the intubation and have the ventilator treatment, the uh, the SpO two is still low, and they cannot uh, maybe they cannot survive even if they have the uh, ventilator treatment. So we give the steroid. Uh, it can it could may. Uh, could uh, uh, increase the SpO2 after we give them uh, three or five days. Uh, but uh, we do not, uh, we are not uh, uh, use the steroid usually for the, some mild patients. And it's not uh, recommended to use in a, uh, mild patients in our national guideline. Thank you. So uh, I would like to add something. Uh, some of the infection disease experts uh, treating uh, COVID-19, they told me uh, steroids uh, function well for uh, this kind of patients, especially for patients when they converted from mild to moderate illness, converted to a severe situation. So just the converting, try to use the steroid as soon as possible. If the patient already two years, Two years, maybe the steroid not so function well. So ratio time and uh, not so big dosage. So you are taking the massive prednisone, uh, 40 milligram per day. So it's a low dosage. Give them for several days. Okay. Okay. So since we have so many questions and they're quite passionate, so can we answer two more questions? Is that possible to answer two more questions? <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, one question for uh, our colleague in uh, East Europe. So now, uh, where is your most challenge for you if there are many patients who came to your hospital? What the most that you want us our help? What's the biggest, biggest problem for you now? Right now, there are two very hot questions uh, you want to ask. So the first one is, do you transport the suspected cases to other hospitals or other um, organizations? Do you transport the suspected yes. cases? Uh, in China, actually, uh, uh, like in, in Wuhan, there are so many the hospitals that can treat uh, COVID-19, but in our province, because we, we don't have so many cases here, so the, hospital, the government set up several, uh, 22 in the Hangzhou city for the uh, determinated hospital. So usually when we 
make sure diagnosis we transfer patient to the designated hospital. But in Wuhan, there are so many hospitals which treat the COVID-19. So our team, we send the, uh, our team went to Wuhan, they, uh, they take out patients in the ICU. Okay. I think the and question for our Ethiopian colleagues is, I think um, the President Wang would like most to ask is, what are the special challenges that our Ethiopian colleagues are facing uh, at the moment? What, what is the biggest problem that you see right now? Yes, uh, yes, you know. this is my question. So I, I don't know if um, any of our colleagues on the Ethi Ethiopian side would like to share, maybe from St. Paul's Hospital. Yes, yes. As Her Excellency, the minister has mentioned, I think three of the top priorities and ch main challenges to us is access to PPE and uh, access to emergency services, including ICU and ventilation requirement. And the other is availability of testing for all contacts. So now we are testing only limited number of patients. So those who are suspected. So but we have also challenges in testing, availability of testing kits. So these are the biggest challenges. So protecting our health workers and availability of adequate PPE and uh, ICUs and emergency services as well as expansion okay. of testing. So especially mechanical ventilators and PPE materials and testing kits are a critical challenge for us. Okay. So the PPE, ICU and uh, limited space, limited room numbers. As well as availability of also testing, probably. So what we are currently doing is the real time PPR. So if we wanted to adopt also your discharge protocol, so it would have been better for us also to have these uh, immunology tests like the rapid tests, IgM and IgG. So, so yeah. Uh, the All right. So uh, I understand. Like, uh, you have so many questions, but the time is limited. So, um, thank you. Since our participants has a lot of questions, I would like to refer you to the GMCC program, and uh, which is the Global Med Exchange for Combating COVID-19. Uh, you can go to the website, which is the covid 19 alibabaclubcom There's um, International Expert Medical Communication Center, which uh, the hospital in China also joined in, which is the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine. They also joined. So if you have questions and want to get some resources from there, you can go to the website and get this information. How's that? And if you don't have the um, don't have the app to scan, you can scan the QR code shown online, and then you can go to the website and ask questions from there. So. All right, I think thank you all to coming for the for this webinar. I hope this is going to be really helpful for you. And I think it's a foundation. So maybe later we can fight the COVID-19 together. Um, we believe that must, we must share our resources and know-how and hard learned lessons with you to win the battle against COVID-19 together. And this is the one fight, one world, one bite. So thank you so much for coming and good night. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.